In the opening shot of Whiplash, Andrew Neiman, a timid, talented young drummer, is engaged with his craft, focused intently on his domain as the camera, serving as the eyes of the master, crawls towards him. Terence Fletcher's reputation and authority at Schaefer Conservatory precede him, and after he asks Andrew to demonstrate his skill, Double time swing. Andrew's taste of greatness quickly turns to self-doubt as Fletcher leaves unimpressed. As we come to learn, this is one of Fletcher's methods for rooting out mediocrity and motivating practice, a challenge to which Andrew rises. Andrew finds his purpose in the pursuit of greatness, wanting nothing more than to be the next Charlie Parker, Andrew's legendary jazz icon, and he is met with a master who desires for him the same fate. Throughout Whiplash, Fletcher acts as both the mentor and the villain, both the fuel driving Andrew and the obstacle that stands in his way. Whiplash tells the story of Andrew's struggle for meaning at the hands of a tyrant, which manifests into obsession, sacrifice, and eventually, greatness. While at first Fletcher is presented as the stern, hard-nosed coach who would challenge and hopefully aid Andrew along his path, this image of Fletcher falls apart faster than Andrew can drum. In their first conversation since Andrew's recruitment into Fletcher's studio band, Andrew tells Fletcher about his parents' divorce and his father's career, details of his personal life that Fletcher goes on to use very effectively in his verbal abuse, specifically insulting Andrew's father, Jim. You are a worthless, friendless, faggot-lipped little piece of shit whose mommy left daddy when she figured out he wasn't Eugene O'Neill, and who is now weeping and slobbering all over my drum set like a fucking nine-year-old girl. Jim is a caring father, an evidently competent teacher, and a decent person, but he represents a future that Andrew fears and is desperate to avoid. You get to be my age. You get perspective. I don't want perspective. Ooh, sorry. Jim never became a great writer, he is overly agreeable, and it's safe to say that Fletcher would call him a failure. There's no doubt that Jim wants Andrew to live up to his potential, but he has a broader perspective for his son's well-being than Fletcher, the father figure who is most invested in Andrew's transformation as a drummer. Oh my dear God. Are you one of those single-tier people? Rather than becoming more confident about his passion, Andrew's first lesson with Fletcher fills him with shame and fear, which Fletcher hopes will result in non-stop practice. Start practicing harder, Neiman. Andrew embraces the grind in a terrifying yet inspiring way, with every drop of blood on his drumstick bringing him one step closer to both greatness and suffering. In an interview about the film, director Damien Chazelle said of practice that, if every single thing is enjoyable, then you're not pushing yourself hard enough. The process of self-transformation through the hammering away of your flaws and exposing your weaknesses is anything but fun, even if you have a passion and a drive. But Whiplash explores a competitive setting in which drive is replaced by obsession, authority is replaced by tyranny, and practice is replaced by self-harm. Don't slow down. Watching Andrew endure his torturous training under the cruel tutelage of Terence Fletcher elicits a mix of horror and spellbinding admiration. But even as he works his fingers to the bone, the ways in which Andrew is promoted by Fletcher don't feel entirely fair. The reason he got into Fletcher's band in the first place is because he knew that Fletcher would want to hear the double time swing and had time to practice, as opposed to maybe an equally qualified Connolly. Andrew leapfrogs the core drummer, Tanner, by losing Tanner's sheet music while having memorized it himself. Maybe a janitor came by or something. A janitor? Yeah. Find the fucking folder! Good for Andrew, but think about how Tanner feels. This poor guy had endured drumming for Fletcher despite his memory issues, and he got demoted because of an unlikely happenstance. If that ever happened to me, I'd quit and switch to pre-med like Tanner. I guess he got discouraged. Fletcher's most effective tool for inspiring fear and anxiety his secret recipe for hard work and discipline is the control of status. In a normal competitive environment, individuals can rise through the ranks by demonstrating their skill, and there's always a risk that your spot will be taken by somebody more skillful. But the competitive hierarchy of the Schaefer Studio Band is consumed by tyranny, only to be ascended by the will of the tyrant. From the way that the camera follows Fletcher's lead, to the way that Fletcher toys with his musicians, it is clear that Fletcher is in complete control, wielding power over his students by making them fear replacement and exile. 
As we see during Andrew's first practice, Fletcher can demote you or kick you out of his band at any time for any reason. For the record, Mitz was not a tune, but he didn't know, and that's bad enough. Fletcher's draconian training tactics are no doubt abusive, but they are particularly effective on Andrew, at least insofar as inflaming his obsession. Where yelling and slapping proved to be effective motivators the first time around, the threat of replacement begins to drive Andrew into madness. Am I late? Perfect timing. Being Tanner's alternate after coming from the lower level band felt like being on top of the world. But to become an alternate after having worked the way Andrew did to become a core, Andrew wouldn't stand for it, and his mania, fear, and anger begin to spill out from the cracks in his breaking psyche. Oh my god, you, are you serious? Thanks. That shit? To Fletcher, it hardly matters how much mental anguish Andrew goes through, or how much damage he is doing to his future, as long as Fletcher can make him bang the drums just a little bit faster. Fletcher! Because of the depraved game that Fletcher set in motion, Andrew simply falls deeper into the palm of Fletcher's hand with each victory. This is why I don't think that we should be together. As Andrew continues along his chaotic descent into obsession, he ends his relationship with his girlfriend, Nicole, treating her as someone to be sacrificed in the blind pursuit of greatness. While their breakup can be read as a foolish sacrifice rather than a mark of Andrew's instability, Andrew's mind is clearly starting to slip under Fletcher's pressure as he barrels towards self-destruction. Andrew had spent a long time bleeding during his practice sessions, and as his obsession fully overtakes him, the blood follows the broken artist onto the stage. You're done. At this moment, the image of Fletcher as a misguided teacher obsessed with his student's success disappears, leaving a villain who only destroys potential in even the most promising and resilient students. Had it not been for a debilitating car accident, Andrew may well have ended up like Sean Casey, one of Fletcher's talented students who graduated and rose through the ranks of Lincoln Center before his eventual suicide. Sean suffered from anxiety and depression. His mother claims this started during his time as Fletcher's student. In the aftermath of Andrew's expulsion from Schaefer, Jim sees Fletcher only as a monster who harmed his child. This idea is irreconcilable with Andrew's toxic view of his tormentor as a teacher trying to inspire his artistic growth toward mastery. Even though in the heat of the moment, Andrew wanted to strangle Fletcher, he does not hold a grudge. He didn't do anything. After the two get a chance to meet again at a jazz club, Andrew hears out Fletcher's bullshit and even accepts his invitation to perform at a jazz festival. There's no reason Andrew would hesitate to sue Fletcher, or especially be willing to drum for Fletcher again, unless Andrew fundamentally respected Fletcher's brutal ambition in realizing musical potential. The truth is, Andrew, I... never really had a Charlie Parker. But I tried. I actually fucking tried. And that's more than most people ever do. And I will never apologize for how I tried. When Andrew arrives to face his final trial, despite his rigorous training, he is still not ready. His shaking knees and sweaty palms are echoes of his abuse at Schaefer, and point to his underlying fear of failing Fletcher. And fail he does. You think I'm fucking stupid? What? I know it was you. After Andrew's bloody, blaring struggle against his master, his apprenticeship under Fletcher ended with a whimper. But if I have learned anything from classic sports movies, it's that the hero needs to be down in the final act before they can make the game-winning play. Fletcher, as both mentor and monster, challenged Andrew to reach perfection, and now the only thing standing in Andrew's way is his inability to transcend his master's authority. He regains his composure, hugs his father, and, to Fletcher's surprise, returns to the stage, his jittering replaced by a resolve to play the best motherfucking solo the world has ever heard. The question is, who is he playing for? Andrew's transformation in the final act, though now complete, is thematically contorted. Either Andrew has overcome his master and has begun to play for himself, 
Unfazed by Fletcher's anger, or he has completed his descent into madness, becoming a machine resolved to conquer its master's last challenge to give a flawless performance. Whether Andrew has overcome his oppressor or is just trying to dazzle his teacher, Andrew's transformation resulted in drumming that Fletcher had never heard before. While Fletcher walked onto that stage planning to humiliate Andrew and destroy his ambitions, Andrew's epic drum solo seems to vindicate Fletcher, giving him the satisfaction of knowing that Andrew's chaotically captivating performance was the result of his training as well as his presence. By the end of the film, both Andrew and Fletcher claim their respective redemptions. Andrew proves to Fletcher that he will never be stopped from being one of the greats, and Fletcher finally gets the chance to conduct one. One of the moments that stands out during Whiplash's finale is the shot of Jim watching his son's performance from the backstage. The look in his eyes is that of both horror and astonishment, an image that encapsulates Andrew's transformation. He is horrified by the sacrifice and astounded by the art. As Andrew plays on, Fletcher is uncharacteristically eager to assist, becoming the coach figure that he never got the chance to be. The smile on Andrew's face after Fletcher gives him a grin of approval reveals the pair's complicated relationship. Fletcher can see himself as the villain of Andrew's story and yet revel in his own defeat. The underlying purpose of their conflict, after all, is Andrew's transformation, with his strength expressed through the challenge he overcame. As much as Whiplash is a cautionary tale about the dangers of tyranny and obsession, it illustrates the need to sacrifice for perfection. The ends might not justify the means, but both Fletcher and Andrew himself needed Andrew to transform into the next Charlie Parker. And in the final, mesmerizing moments of Whiplash's dizzying finale, Bird lives.